This is the Digging Deeper podcast, where we engage in today's questions from a Christian perspective. Hello, we're back here with Pastor Marty today, and we're going to be talking about gardening. Well, a question I'd start with is, what is your favorite gardening story in the Bible, or gardening imagery, or parable, or... (laughs) Well, that's a hard one. My favorite gardening story, because they're all really good. Mm -hmm. Probably... There's so many to choose from. Mm Mm-hmm. Probably, probably Matthew thirteen. Okay. Uh, parable of the of the sower and the soils. Mm. Uh, because it's that's life. Yeah. I mean, that's what life is like. Yeah. You know, it's like uh, that's what it's like if you're a gardener trying to grow something. Mm. You have opposition. You have birds eat the seed. You know, neighbors. You know, so weeds into your yard and you know stuff. And that's exactly what the gospel's like when you throw it out into the world. So that mm. that's a really good imagery, especially if you've seen Israel and you see all the rolling hills and you mm. see the wheat growing on the hillsides, blowing in the wind when you're walking to different sites to see like the Sea of Sal- Sea of Galilee and you can hear the wind blowing through the wheat and think that some farmer was up here on this mountainside casting mm. you know seed out here. Yeah, you can see Jesus with the disciples. I mean, easy. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so that that one has a great because that whole chapter is a great chapter because he because he also talks about how uh, weeds will grow in among the wheat. Yeah, isn't that that's he tells that story right after he talks mm-hmm. about the the enemy casting weeds mm-hmm. in as it was growing, and then yeah. the people are like, "Why? Let's pull out the weeds." And then the, yeah, he yeah. says, "We should wait till the end of time." Yeah. So gardening becomes eschatology, a study of the end times. Mm. And then one, there was one time I, I was uh, in Israel. I was going through the Valley of Elah, which is where David fought Goliath mm-hmm. uh, at the riverbed. Uh, it's a little tiny, little little valley. Little, I wouldn't even call it a valley per se. It's just a little tiny valley in between two hills. Mm-hmm. Israelites were on one side. Uh, Philistines were on another, uh, and I was I was walking down there. You just pull your bus off the side of the road. It's not like a formal, you know, state park or anything in Israel. Mm-hmm. And so we just pulled the bus off, and we're hiking down there to the riverbed. And there's a wheat field there. Well, the wheat as we're walking through the wheat field or alongside the wheat field, wheat field there's um, thistle. And thistle is the worst weed ever known to man. Mm-hmm. It's terrible. It's, it cuts the, cuts you to pieces if you try to pull it. And it was it was woven into this farmer's wheat field, hmm. you know? And as we're walking down to the riverbed with David and Goliath, I'm like, so I, I, stopped the, I stopped the tour group and told them, you need to look at that wheat field. And they're like, yo, what are we looking at? Well, you're, you're looking at Matthew 13. Hmm. And, you know, we see the weeds, you know? And so the weeds, you know, were blended in with the wheat. There's no way you could take the thistle out without taking the wheat out, you know. So it, it has a great connotation because that's life. Yeah. Believers are interwoven with unbelievers, uh, and they will not be divided until God divides them. Yeah. So, you know, you truly can study gardening and study theology. Yeah. I mean, you truly can. I mean, if you, if you pay attention. So I'd say Matthew 13 in the New Testament is probably my favorite. What do you what do you think is the takeaway of that that verse or that story on on the you know the weeds being sown in with the wheat like as a believer specifically like you know that's life like that's the way it is what what do we do with the fact that this is the way it is Well you're not going to you're not going to alter it I mean mm-hmm. I think a lot of people think they're going to create utopia here based on their own legislation of morality and the things and it's not wrong to try to legislate mm-hmm. moral things and stuff but you're not going to retake create the kingdom of christ only he can do that mm-hmm. all we can do is hold back evil mm-hmm. to some degree and so it's just a reality check to say you know the weeds are with you until christ appears mm-hmm. so you know don't hyperventilate don't get discouraged realize what you're dealing with and carry on. And what are you supposed mm-hmm. to do? You're supposed to cast the gospel seed. Mm-hmm. That's that's what you're called to do. Yeah. And the Lord takes care of where it lands and if it's productive, non-productive. You're just supposed to be a farmer who's faithful to cast the seed and not worry about the weeds. Mm. So I think sometimes we get too caught up with all the weeds that surround us and you lose heart and you get discouraged, you get disappointed. Uh, and it's like, oh no, the Lord will deal with him when he appears. Mm. We are. We just have to kind of put up with it, and do what we're called to do. Yeah, and I think it's almost like relieving, 
to know that there can be a sense of, oh, I'm responsible. Like, why are there weeds? You know, am I, is this the way it's supposed to be? You know, it's like, this is the way it's going to be. And so Mm -hmm. having that can set you at ease with, you know, the anxiety and the frustration and the, you know. And the weeds, when you study weeds, because I've had to study weeds, you know, if you want to do, like before I moved here, uh, wealthy people used to pay me uh, just to come to their homes and make sure there were no weeds on their property. Mm. That's all they paid me for. Yeah. They'd have their own, you know, gardener for mowing, edging, trimming, (laughs) blowing. And I was the anti-weed guy. Yeah. Um, And so, so that's what I did is I showed up and I knew what the weeds were. Uh, I knew what chemicals would take out certain weeds in the turf, in the planter beds, like whatever. Uh, and so that's all, that's all they paid me for. And they paid mm-hmm. me really good money to go do that. They were paying me for what I knew. Uh, but in the course of that, you learn weeds and what they look like. And some of them look exactly like the plants that are not weeds. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, you know, that's a whole spiritual metaphor because mm-hmm. that's the way the devil operates. Yeah, You know, you have truth that God plants in the world, and then the devil comes along and sows untruths, but they look similar to the truth, so they deceive people, Mm -hmm. you know? And so when I do gardening, I think about that all the time, because I see weeds that look, and they almost, they're almost identical to the plant that I'm trying to grow, Mm -hmm. and then there's a weed wrapped up in it that looks similar to it, but it's not the plant, Yeah, you know, so... Even weed analysis can can teach you much. Yeah, you know. And another thing about taking out another thing like taking out thistle or any kind of weed. The other reason, from a gardening perspective, when you pull a weed, and and homeowners do it all the time. You know, they pull the weeds or they hoe the weeds. But if you reach down and pull a weed, like spotted spurge, grows really low to the ground, grows all over the place. People hate it. I hate it. But if you reach down and pull it. If you took a magnifying glass and flipped it upside down and looked at the bottom of the leaves, there's little microscopic seed balls. Mm. So when you pull it you're and you're it. feeling all victorious, you just planted hundreds of seeds. Mm. That's why it just keeps coming back, coming back, coming back. You know, so that's another reason I'm sure the Lord said, you know, wait till the end of the age. Because you go pulling weeds, you get more weeds. Mm. You know, and so there's instructive stuff and in all of that if you pay attention while you're gardening. Yeah. So every time you go into the yard to garden, it should be a spiritual experience. Yeah, absolutely. You should be excited to fire up that, you know, two cycle <laughs> weed eater or whatever. Because yeah. you might learn something. Yeah. But what do you think believers who, you know, who are who are wheat, you know, in this story they're wheat, but who were once weeds, right? You know, if this story is about believers and unbelievers. How do you think believers who are wheat and were once weeds, or if you think about the story, you know, the parable of the sower, like who, you know, only by the grace of God were, are fertile soil, like how should they interact? You know, because I think, I think the danger, I guess what I'm trying to say is the danger or the temptation with like, oh, there are weeds and there is wheat and, you know, there's no. us and them. Like how, how do we handle that in a way that's not like, you know, superiority, but distinction you know, do you know what I'm asking? Yeah, so so bread comes from what? Bread comes from wheat. There you go, okay? Jesus called himself? The bread of life. The bread of life. So he who is a weed, mm. who partakes of the bread of life, has life. Mm. So what is a weed? Well, a weed's just a beggar who's looking for something meaningful mm. and hasn't found it yet. But when he finds it, well, that's Christ, the bread of life. Yeah. So what are you when you when you're not a weed anymore? When you're wheat, we you're just a former beggar who happened to find the bread of life that came from wheat, mm. and you know where it is. And so you, you're you looking on the weed uh, with compassion, knowing that used to be me. Mm-hmm. Thought I had all the answers. Thought Christians were crazy. Mm-hmm. You know, thought my arguments against God were all airtight. You know, thought you know my money would make me happy and secure and all that, all the, all the lies that you believe. And then all of a sudden you find out that you don't have happiness. Uh, and that, why did that, why, why does the Christian have so much joy? Hmm. You know? And then when you find the bread of life that they point you to, then you're transformed by God's good grace from a weed 
which is impossible for weeds to be transformed, but God mm. can take a weed and transform it into a stalk of wheat. Yeah. 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 But for the, for, for the wheat to produce anything, it has to die. Mm. It has to fall to the ground. It has to dry and break open and produce the seed to regenerate itself. Mm. And there's, there's illustrations even in that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's so crazy that, yeah, I don't know, just in, in the faith and in, in the scripture, like about death preceding life is so antithetical to what we experience. Yeah. But even in that is a, is a metaphor of the resurrection. Yeah. Because you come into this earth as a new Christian, you look like, to follow the metaphor, you look like wheat. Mm -hmm. And you're full of seed and productivity and et cetera. But that seed eventually dies. Mm -hmm. But inside that seed is inherent a new life you know, that, you know, is, is going to come forth. Yeah. And that's, that's another illustration of what lies ahead for the Christian. It's not, it's not death. And that's the end of it all. Like secular humanism would say, you have a birthday, you have a death day, and then that's over. Mm -hmm. No, you have a birthday and you have a death day. But if you had a second birthday in there that was mm -hmm. spiritual, then your death day is the day that you have a life day. Yeah. Cause you walk into God's presence. So again, you learn that from wheat. Yeah. Cause wheat dies. Yeah. And it's only effective when it dies. Mm. Well, what's the last thing man wants to do? Die. Yeah. And I think even even just the like the constant death of being a believer, of constantly dying to yourself and, you know, that practice of, you know, Christ living in me and not me living in my own of my own, you know, right. flesh and sin. So yeah. 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 So that can all be learned from gardening. Yeah. Yeah. Again, it's why people should work in their yard. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. I always say, I mean, I was talking to a neighbor the other day who had a really nice yard, but you know, I was like, your yard? Well, if, well, I was talking to a guy yesterday uh, between the services, and uh, he sold his new home here, bought an, uh, renting a new home here, and he's going to take the money they got from the sale of their house and then use that in retirement, mm -hmm. and buy a house somewhere else. And so he's in a rental home mm -hmm. where the renter, the owner, doesn't take care of the property. Uh -huh. And he's moved in there from a really nice house with a really nice yard to one that's, you know, jacked up and not. So he's, you know, trimming trees, trimming bushes, planting mm. this plant. It's not even his house. Yeah. But he's like, I'm going to be here for three years. I got to fix this thing up. Yeah. And he's and he's like, uh, you know, the outside of the house is a reflection of me. Yeah. And I'm like, amen to that. Mm. You know. And that's where a lot of parishioners don't don't invite me over to their homes. <laughs> They're like, I don't want to see. I don't. I, like, I went to this Air Force Colonel's yard house a couple months ago for dinner, and uh, <laughs> they're like, P "Please just park in the driveway and and don't look at the yard. Just <laughs> come in quickly." And it's hilarious. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, it's it's okay, but you can spend a little more time out here. It's a <laughs> spiritual thing. But yeah. Anyway, yeah. Some. Some are not motivated yet, so yeah. But it does it does represent you, mm -hmm. you know. I think yeah, because there's so much wrapped in it that's of a spiritual nature. So mm -hmm. so anyway, yeah. But yeah, so Matthew 13 is a great passage. Yeah. Um, now, could you, for anyone who's listening and maybe isn't super familiar with the story of the, the parable of the sower, we talked about the other one, but could you just you know give us an overview of that story? An overview of that story off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the sower goes forth to soil and he sows the soil into the field. The field is the word um, of God, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and it goes into the world and it falls on four different kinds of soil. Mm -hmm. um, so the three different kinds of soil, um, you know, some is on, you know, on a stony path, it doesn't germinate, you know, the birds come and eat it. Um, some falls in ground that looks like it's great and produces, and people tell me this all the time. It's like, you know, I, I planted seed, it grew, it germinated really fast, it looked awesome, and then all of a sudden it died. Mm -hmm. What's well, because there was rocks underneath the ground mm -hmm. that when the sun came up and heated the ground, it baked the rocks and cooked the roots of your new grass. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, there's another kind of gospel seed that's thrown in a person's life like that. Wow, they, they look like they were so excited about godly principles and the gospel and stuff. What happened? And mm. So the first three types of seed are the three kinds of people that the gospel seed falls on. Mm. The fourth one is the good soil. Um, 
and if you're into gardening, you automatically know there's different there's different kinds of soil. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, the better your soil, the better your plants, the better your yard, that whole shebang. So the gospel seed f- falls on the fourth soil, and then that one produces fruit at different yield levels. Mm. Uh, but it does produce fruit, which is what a Christian does. A Christian, we all we all come in different shapes and sizes, and we all produce different amounts of spiritual. Uh, I don't know. I didn't forget the word. Is. We we produce d- different kinds of spiritual uh, things for God mm. at different amounts. Mm. Um, treasure. That's the word I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. Um, and so some are extremely productive, some are a little productive, but we're all productive. That's the Christian. And so, the, I mean, the big question from that opening parable is, which, you know, which person are you? You know, mm-hmm. which yeah. person are you? Because uh, there's the one, you know, that the seed is planted and the weeds uh, grow up and those are the cares of life and things of life mm. choke out the seed. And you see that when you talk to people. Like I, I have a friend, uh, his name is Jim. Uh, when I got out of, when I left the PhD program in Dallas, in Dallas Seminary that I didn't finish back in 1985, uh, when I left that program with Nathan's autistic based issues, um, I went and worked in a warehouse, drove a forklift loading trucks all day. So I, I picked up an average of, I don't know, probably three to 4,000 pounds a day of paper mm. or more um, loading pallets and stuff. And there was a young guy there that I led to Christ in our in our um, break room one day. His name was Jim. Uh, and typical California guy, happy-go-lucky. Mom was a ski instructor in Vail, Colorado, and you know, kind of cool guy, but he wasn't a Christian. And so I led him in, at lunch, I led him to Christ. And discipled him for the year that I worked there before I went to my first church. Uh, and so I left for my first church in 1986. And uh, I did his wedding. Hmm, probably did his wedding about a year later. He got married. Mm-hmm. And I haven't heard from him since. So this is now what, 2022. So the other day, just for the fun of it, I uh, Googled in his name to see where he was. And I got his obituary. Mm. Uh, and he was, well, see, I'm 64. I think he was... 52 when he died oh, yeah. and um and so i read i went and i found his obituary page and i read his obituary page and um not a not a single thing on it about his faith hmm. not a thing hmm. that's scary that's sad yeah you know talked about how he could swim in any body of water and was fearless to dive off of this and that into water i mean th- that's that's what it did to showcase his life hmm. And I'm thinking, Jim, what happened to your, what happened to your life, your spiritual life? Because mm. none of it was in there, you know. So I'm mm. sitting there thinking, what what kind of gospel seed was that? Mm. And I won't know until I get to heaven, you know, and God sorts those things out. But you know, that's Jim could be an illustration of any one of those first three seeds. Yeah. You know? It was an emotional thing he did. Didn't mm. really mean it. Wasn't that much into it. It was a fad, whatever, you know. So, so those illustrations do start making a whole lot of sense to you because you see them in the people that you deal with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that's a, it's a great little passage. Yeah, there's yeah. a song I heard. I heard a while ago, but I reheard recently by uh, John Mark McMillan. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he, he wrote yeah. How He Loves and some other songs. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know that song. Mm-hmm. But he wrote, it's called The Road, The Rocks, and The Weeds. And it's combining a lot of concepts at one, but one of the things it's really talking about is, is really just, it's kind of wrestling with the idea of like, why does God allow suffering? But also in the light of this story, and he's talking about, and it also parallels it to like, Greek mythology and he's like talking about how Zeus didn't come down from Olympus and it's this idea of like the heart of our maker was spread out on the road the rocks and the weeds like the idea of like that God sent his word to everyone not just those who would accept like I don't know which I thought was a really cool pairing of these concepts well he does because the gospel is is whoever yeah and it does it goes out to whoever yeah and you know yeah, it's it's, it's God's just, grace. Yeah, yeah. I think it's just you know like the the effort spent to even so where to give chance to you know soil that wouldn't wouldn't reap a harvest. 
So yeah, but even if you if you look at the last the last uh, type of soil in that parable, the good soil um, that produces at different amounts, so, you know, some eighty fold, some hundred fold, etc. Mm-hmm. When you look at that particular outcome, then you look at your life and you say, okay, you know, what am I producing for God? What am I doing for God? Uh, what's my soil like? Well, there's different kinds of soil. And so at my house, I have a soil test kit. Mm-hmm. Uh, because when I moved into my house, my whole backyard was trees, uh, no turf, no fence, which from California freaked me out because I had never lived in a house that didn't have a fence. <laughs> so the first thing I did was I built a fence. All my neighbors thought I was insane. And then they're like, oh, that's cool. We think we'll build one. So then they <laughs> did. That was totally funny. The wire fence is a bigger thing in California. Why? Yeah. Oh, my, Californians are big on this is my property. Oh, okay. You know, don't like, come over here. Yeah. Yeah, okay. they're huge on their privacy. Gotcha. Um, and so then I had to take down all the trees that I could. And then the really huge trees, I had to have crews come in and take them out. But anyway, mm-hmm. the youth group came over when I first moved in there, a bunch of kids with rakes, the junior hires, and they raked 140 gallon bags of leaves off my backyard. Wow. <laughs> that's a lot that's like years is left <laughs> yeah they, they, <laughs> the backyard had never been raked yeah it was a total mess uh it took me about four years to re-landscape it to where now it's you know got you know turf and everything's cool but it took me about four years to redo it but the point was with all of those leaves for all of those years like 30 years mm. and that didn't even get down to the dirt when they raked away all those bags yeah i still couldn't see dirt oh my god so i still had to haul away more bags but anyway when i finally got down to the dirt and I planted grass and the grass just pink. And you know, my first spring I was here, the grass just took off. I'm like, oh, this is awesome. Mm. Well then all of a sudden it just all died. Mm. I'm like, what in the world? Uh, so I got a toil- soil test kit and I went out and I tested the soil. It's kind of like a kit that you use when you, I used to clean swimming pools. Mm. And so it's like a same kind of plastic little kit and you drop little tablets in the water and you drop some dirt in there as a sample. Yeah. And you shake it up and then it tells you what the pH level of the dirt is okay and uh, and it will tell you if you have uh if your dirt's too hot if it's too acidic etc so so i so i did a soil test kit and it came up like super hot because all the leaves of all those years Mm -hmm. had broken down and made the soil real acidic so what happened was the the seed got going and there's lots of great nutrients in it right at the beginning and then it hit that acidic base of the dirt and just fried the roots Mm. so my first go at a lawn here in Virginia was not successful uh, because of that. So then I had to change the pH value of the yard by bringing mm. in lime. And then there's a certain ratio of, you know, so many pounds of lime. I think it's, I think it's 40 pounds of lime per thousand square feet, something like that to change the pH value. So I had to do that. Okay. Yeah. So I couldn't plant a yard until I fixed the dirt. Mm-hmm. So my yard wasn't going to be product, pr- productive until I did something to the dirt. Mm. Uh, so if you apply that to your life, yeah. same thing. Yeah, You know, it's like, well, my life's productive and I want it to be productive, but maybe there's things keeping my life from being more productive, you know? So if God did a soil test kit on my soil, mm. you know, what would it come up as? Mm. Well, maybe it's too acidic, it's a too abrasive, it's too this, it's too that. Well, what would God want to change in my life that makes me more productive? Yeah. You know, less judgmental. You know, more flexible. I mean, what what would he want to change mm. so I could be more productive? So even the soil that's listed there that produces, since it all produces at different rates, mm. it means you know either the seed germinated at a lesser rate in some soil, greater rate in other soil, but it all relates to what kind of soil it was in. Mm-hmm. Those are different kinds of people. Yeah, and different even, kinds of Christians. Yeah. So, anyway, and even just I mean the concept of the time it takes for you know soil to be more productive it's not just in a year you had it good and up and running and oh, it was a no. nice garden you know oh no it took it took it took years yeah because then i had for me to put in drainage um to dig for drains across my yard from my house to run the water away from my house downhill because my backyard's kind of a downhill mm. uh slightly but uh to dig took forever because it was solid tree roots. So to dig one foot yeah. was major work because of all the tree roots that were intertwined, you know? So to put all, I put uh, landscape lighting, upward lighting in all my trees back there. So at night it's really pretty. Yeah. <laughs> but that was no 
easy task to get done. That took forever. Which, if you relate that to your life, this is kind of like discipleship, you know, bear your cross, mm. follow me. You know, it's not going to be easy to get something great, a great product. It's going to take a lot of work, a lot of sacrifice. Mm. But at, the whole time I'm doing it, I'm thinking, well, that that's this is like discipleship, you know, to turn really bad dirt into great dirt and to turn a really lousy yard into a great yard. Well, that's kind of like your life. Yeah. That takes a lot of work, a lot of discipline, a lot of sacrifice, and it's going to take years. Mm. Like Leroy Imes wrote a book. Oh my gosh, it's probably probably in the early 70s. Uh, he was a navigator called The Art of Disciple Making. And in that book, he says, to create a disciple of Christ, a very mature disciple of Christ that you mentor. And I read this book a long time ago, maybe, maybe 40 years ago I read it. But if I remember correctly, he says it takes 10 years to grow a successful disciple. Mm. <laughs> 10 years. Yeah. You know. It's a long time. <laughs> that is a long time. So, but that's like commitment to, you know, a farmer to his field, mm. a gardener to his yard. You know, if you want something great that produces in a great fashion, then it's going to take a lot of commitment. Yeah, man. And how many things do we commit 10 years to doing? <laughs> I kept, oh, no. I don't think I've ever committed yeah. that much time or even yeah. college is probably the longest commitment of a thing that I did. <laughs> yeah. And that was four years. And by the end, I was very done. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you get to, you get tired. Yeah, but you'll you'll get a second wind. Yeah, <laughs> on things. Yeah. The other thing about weeds, which a lot of I was I was over helping one of our parishioners this weekend, um, with her yard, um, because she she has a new house and uh, and so she mows the lawn and then this other grass pops up really quickly, and she's like, what is that stuff? You know, she said, my yard looks great till that stuff pops up. She says, almost like you can mow and it just comes up behind you. And she said, it looks like grass. Uh, what is that? So I so I went over there and I uh, was looking at her yard. And I'm like, well, um, that's nut grass. She's like, what is nut grass? Well, that's nut grass. It's a sedge grass. And if you pull it, it you pull it and it comes out really easy and it's got little fibrous uh, roots and it looks like you totally got it and you, and, it, and you defeated it. And then... And it comes right back because I said, you just broke off the top of it. The rest of the roots are under the ground uh, and it's producing other, you know, it's putting out little feelers to grow other pieces of nutgrass all over your yard. Mm. And she's like, well, why did it start on the f- side of my driveway? And I said, well, th- if you pay attention to weeds, they don't typically start in the middle of your yard. They start around the perimeter, like crabgrass, mm-hmm. if you ever watch it in somebody's yard. Well, I do, but... It starts in the starts in the perimeter of your yard. Just that's what that's what nutgrass does because it blows there from your neighbor. Mm. <laughs> and so I told her, so all you got to do is start looking at your neighbor's yard, and you can tell the direction usually where this stuff came from. Uh-huh. So when you're trying to control the invasion of weeds like sin in your own life, you might have to go over to a neighbor and which I've done in my neighborhood, my next door neighbor, because we our yards are together. Mm-hmm. And so I've had to teach him over the years about weed management because his weeds become my weeds. Mm. Well, that's a spiritual illustration. Yeah. You know, so if you just think your life is compartmentalized and, you know, my sin is private and it's not going to bother me, oh, uh, no, mm. you know, <laughs> it's going to be invasive. And so it's like, I don't know. I, the, all the time I think about it, it it's, it's it's so instructive because your neighbor's life is going to impact your life. So his life's out of control because he doesn't control his yard. Mm-hmm. It's going to be your problem. So when I was showing this lady, you know, what nut grass was and, you know, and how it comes into a yard. And she's like, why is it only growing around the edges and not kind of teaching her how to spot it yeah. and stuff like that. And here's how you treat it. And here's how you, here's how you can get rid of it. Um, it's like dealing with sin. Yeah. And it's all from just, you know, going over to talk to a prisoner about her yard. Yeah. Um, so all that stuff, I mean, it all relates back to Matthew 13. Yeah. You know, the good, the good seed and weeds, uh, because there's so many ways you could take the metaphor and apply it to your life. Yeah. 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 And like in, in with that, you know, the, the upkeep it takes, like there's no... A weedless yard doesn't stay a weedless yard because it is a weedless yard. It's like, uh, no, yeah, <laughs> it takes, yeah. Well, well, that, that's why in Hebrews it talks about, 
you know, the sins that easily beset you as a Christian. Mm. You know, we all have sins that trip us up, uh, and and you can't you can't believe you did them again, you know. And it's like it takes constant maintenance. And um, so what I do uh, when I take care of my yard, um, I have uh, I bought those commercial grade gray bottles. Uh, you get them at like Home Depot or wherever. It's a gray bottle, and it keeps the chemicals in there from going bad. Mm-hmm. Um, and has a great good sprayer on the end of it. And then I mix, I think I have, I probably have five or six different bottles mixed with different things to kill specific weeds. So I have them mixed all the time. So when I mow, that's when I can see the weeds the best. Yeah. So when I mow, then I go back in my garage and I grab the bottles in question that will address those kinds of weeds in turf. And then I, I'm, my neighbors probably think I'm, crazy but i walk around out there and you know and just just nail them and then you know if i have a little oxalis coming up over here or whatever or wild violets are really big here they can take over your yard they're super invasive Mm. um so i have different sprays for different things so i just walk around and just nail them well if you don't nail them they become your yard yeah you know and um like i've gone to people in church they've had me come over to look at their yards and I'm like, uh, you're just going to have to nuke the whole yard. <laughs> it's gonna be, I mean, you know, it's, it's going to be radical. Yeah. So I, you know, so all of us is, is spiritually instructive. So it's just that general maintenance confession of sin, you know, it's like shooting the weed with a spray is keeping, keeping on top of it, yielding to the spirit. You know, if you got anger management issues, but you're yielding to the spirit, you're keeping that in question and check mm-hmm. so you can, you know, be a man of peace and blah, blah, blah. But it's just it's daily maintenance. And yeah. I, I mean, that's what mean, weed management teaches you. Yeah. You know, you have to stay on top of it. Hmm. Or else, you know, the birds bring it, drop it in your yard, your neighbor plants it, but he didn't mean to because he let his lawn grow. And I mean, I have neighbors who let their lawn, they won't mow it and it will go to seed. Well, seed's going to blow. You know, so yeah. yeah. I'm the kind of guy that should probably live in the middle of a forest with no neighbors, but <laughs> that's what I always tell my wife. But you know, you're living around people, so you got to learn to uh, like work with them. Mm-hmm. You know, and um, and all that stuff is I don't know. It's all there's all spiritual connotations and in, in in all of that if yeah. you pay attention. Yeah, which I, which I do. Yeah, yeah. and so um, I've always learned. Well, I still do. I mean, even weekly, I'm always I'm always thinking about those kind of things mm. when I'm working in my yard or trimming trimming a tree or cutting something. You know, as you you learn from it. So mm. Scripture gives you the starting point by which to look at those things. Matthew 13 is one small case in point. Yeah, you know, but I mean, there's many other places in Scripture that talk about gardening. So I always tell people you, you should really get into gardening now because you're going to be doing that in, in eternity because that was the first job. Mm. Yep. Bust I just don't think the, I've convinced a lot of people of that notion yet. Cause, bust out the shovel. Well, it'll be a lot easier in eternity. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I always think about it as like, what was Adam thinking? You know, I mean, mm. you know, when he yeah. first went out to till the soil after the weeds got there. Yeah. You really felt the consequences of that decision. Yeah, I know. I had a running argument with my brother in law my wife's Jewish side of the family. He wasn't a Christian and he designed uh, golf courses for Arnold Palmer. Mm. And, um, and so he was very skilled with building golf courses and maintaining perfect turf and stuff. And we had a big discussion one day that was an ongoing discussion for years about weeds. And he was really weed friendly. He was like, you know, I manage my golf courses, you know, to keep them looking great, he, he had he built a golf course in Napa Valley called Rooster Run, but a very really pretty golf course before he died. Mm. But uh, to him, a weed was just a beautiful plant in the wrong location. Mm. <laughs> I've heard people say that. Yeah, I was not so forgiving. I'm like, ah, uh, no, it's weed. And he go, oh no, 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 that's just something beautiful that's in the wrong place. I'm like, wow, okay, okay, maybe I could some learn something from this guy. You know, I mean. Mm. He was more gracious toward a weed than I was. I'm like, we need to figure out how to totally eliminate that thing. Uh, so it was David and I had many discussions about turf and weeds. Yeah, you know, but but then David was one who, you know, never came to Christ. You know, and you know, 
and he would he would have none of the gospel seed, mm. you know, and a guy that knew a ton about, you know, turf and weeds with what he did, you would think that would give him much to think about because he was into the beauty of lawns and things and stuff that he took care of as uh, for golf courses and stuff. Uh, mm. But it, that just ended with him. You know, I look at it and I think at the intricacy of like a rose, the mm. wonder of a rose. I've always built my wife rose gardens at the houses that we've lived at because uh, I love roses um, and just the beauty of them. And yeah. then the art of trying to grow great ones is, is not a simple thing, hmm. you know, and, you know, and I would, I would have thought he would have learned much from those things. Uh, but it, you know, as a non-believer, those things that they were just points of beauty to him. That was hmm. it. You know, yeah. I look at him and think there's something greater in that. Yeah, that I see. So, yeah, it's sad when someone misses the nuance and mm -hmm. depth of you know beauty yeah. that there is there. Well, my mo my mom's brother, my uncle Charles, he's a genius IQ, very smart guy. Um, I think at one point he was the head of the Weather Bureau for the state of Alaska. He's a very smart mm. man. Wow, yeah. uh, he lived in Nome, Alaska, for many years, which is in the middle of nowhere. Uh, but when he retired, he and his uh, wife, my aunt Marg. Um, they got into orchids, growing orchids. Mm. Uh, and then they became some of the leading scientists in the world with orchids. Wow. So if you, he's now deceased, but if you type in my uncle's name, Charles Baker uh, and Marg, M-A-R-J was her name, um, you'll see all of his books. And he would show me his books when he would uh, finish them. They were massive books on or growing orchids all around the world. Wow. I could never read the book. I mean, it was Latin this, French that, <laughs> terms I didn't know what he was talking about. Yeah. So he's a very smart man, uh, but, a, but a total agnostic, hmm. just a total agnostic. And I had many conversations with my uncle over the years until he died about four or five years ago from cancer. But um, great guy, funny guy. Always well, had great stories to tell, you know, very loyal to family and his wife and everything. Grew beautiful flowers. Mm -hmm. And I would tell him, Uncle Charles, all of these beautiful orchids. I mean, you you are the expert on orchids mm -hmm. and, and the wonder of them. And you show how to grow them at different elevations and different climates. And you are the man. Mm -hmm. How can you not see in the complexity of the beauty of these plants, the fingerprint of God? Mm -hmm. and, and he never, he couldn't and wouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I look at those kind of things with eyes of faith and I see the design of God, the mm -hmm. variety of God, the wonder of God, the complexity of God. And my uncle just looks at it as a scientist and analyzes it, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and determines how to grow it at, you know, 4,000 feet, how to grow this at 800 feet below sea level. And, you know, he used all of his weather analysis to study orchids. And then mm -hmm. it was an end in and of itself. Yeah. So before he died, my mom called him, her brother, and said, hey, Charlie, you know, I've told you many times about Jesus and what he did for you. Are you sure you don't want to embrace Jesus by faith? You know, you're standing at the death, death's door. Uh, and, he's, he, and he told my mom, nah, Susie, I, I can't do that. I won't do that. That's sad. Yeah. You know, so his, his free will choice, after many, many discussions... Mm -hmm. That usually related to gardening, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, he he just could not see the, the specified complexity how it showed the hand of God, mm -hmm. and I was like, how can you not see it? You know, and yeah, but in, but all those things they educate if you pay attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and obviously Jesus knew that when he pointed to gardening and he pointed mm -hmm. to trees and just nature and. When he I asked my uncle one time, because he was so smart, and I asked him, I said, Charles, I said, what, what is it that keeps you as a scientist, as a very sharp man, what, what is it keeps you from embracing the Christian faith, the, the Christ of the Christian faith? Because uh, you study all the plants and things that God has made, and how could you not see his fingerprints? And, and he said, well, he said, when I was a little boy, he said I was about 12 years old, he said, your grandpa, his dad, my grandpa was a Choctaw Indian. Mm -hmm. He said, he took me to a Pentecostal church. Uh, and he said, it was a very lively Pentecostal church. And he said, a lot of bizarre things happened in that church. You know, people, you know, yelling and all the things that went on. And he described them all to me. And he said, as a child, that so scared me. 
He said, I thought to myself, if that is what a Christian is, mm. I'll, I will never have any part of that. Mm. And so he looked at that one church and what he saw with all of this, what he would call bizarre behavior, and he determined that that's what all Christians were. Mm. Yeah. And then nothing in the rest of his life would change his mind. Mm. You know, that, that set the course of his understanding of Christianity. Mm. I mean, because he asked me one time, he's like, Marty, you're a smart guy. Why, why are you a Christian? Mm. He asked me that one night before I moved here. And we had a long discussion on, you know, why am I a Christian? Yeah. You know, and I'm like, well, you're, you're the flower scientist. Mm -hmm. Why can't, why wouldn't you see that God has made all of these different species and things and how that happened by accident? Mm -hmm. You know, so we had lots of great discussions. He would just never look at the plant world that he lived in, the gardening world that he loved um, and come to faith. You should have seen his home in Portland. It was. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it was beautiful. It was beautiful. I mean, it was surrounded by awesome gardens of mm. color and beauty. That was my uncle. Yeah. But that it, that's as far as it went. Yeah. And I would look at it and see the fingerprint of God. Yeah. You know, so, but every man has his choice of how he's going to view the world around him. Um, and that's probably why the Lord built a lot of his teaching into um, the landscapes, the flora, the fauna of the land. Uh, because everybody worked it, everybody understood it, yeah, and yeah. they got it, you know, yeah. Because back in in Israel, when they like in Matthew thirteen, when they would plant seed, they would just broadcast it all over the place mm. and uh, hope that it landed on great soil, not like us plowing it in and digging it in, and you know. So theirs was they were much more at the whim of nature mm. or the hand of God, and yeah. so there's a lot of those things they could really understand. Yeah, that's, and that's why Christ, that's why they like to listen to him, because yeah. he spoke in a way that no one ever spoke. Because he related the things they saw in life to their life. Well, thank you, Pastor Marty. Thank you so much for oh, you're welcome your time and sharing. I know you love gardening, and it's great to hear. I love hearing about it. I I need to go home and I do from my well, yard. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> thanks for tuning in. To hear more from Pastor Marty at the Digging Deeper Conference, go to digdeeperdc.com. dot